Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to today's Bible study. From Dominion Church International. We have a kind request. Invite somebody. As we learn. From this infallible word of God. And we believe that your life will not be the same again. Before we begin, let's take a moment to pray. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you yes. for your presence. Mm. Thank you for the access given to us mm. into the wisdom of God. Mm. That even as we dwell upon your word, let it come alive. Yes, Lord. Amplify it in the hearing of our voices. Yes, Lord. That everyone that hears it will respond to it. Mm. Let it heal, change, save King of Glory. Mm. That even as we glorify Jesus Christ, let him be made manifest in the lives of all that hear to the praise and glory of our Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. We will take today's reading from Romans chapter 6 from verse 8 to verse 11. The scripture says, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. And the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. But alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Spirit of the living God. Do your will today. In Jesus' name. In just these verses, we have some very profound. Actually, here we see two spiritual biographies that are unveiled to us. And this applies to every person that is born again. And here they are split into two phases. Or may I say two volumes. Now the first phase is the one that records your life before you became a believer in Jesus Christ. And we looked at it in detail over the last couple of series. This contains your old life in Adam. And what characterizes this life is that you were born and lived under the bondage of sin. You lived in sin. You were under the tyranny of sin. And you loved sin. So you lived for sin. That is who you were before Christ. So that is what characterized your life before 
Jesus received you as his own. Now the second part or the second phase of your life is the one where you now come to Christ. And this is a significant change from who you were before. Before Jesus Christ, you were dead to God. But you were alive to sin. Now when Christ comes in, you now become a new creation in Christ Jesus. So you are now dead to sin. And you are alive to God. So what happens now? is you now have a new master. And that master is Jesus Christ. You are no longer under the tyranny of sin. You are no longer obligated to obey your old master. Yes, there may be times when you do sin. But sin is no longer a habitual pursuit that you engage in. There is no ongoing practice of living in sin. Why? Because now you have freedom in Jesus Christ. To live the life that he intended for you to live. So if there were two volumes of books, one phase or one book is closed. The old book or the old phase of your life is done away with. And the good news is this, it can never be reopened. So by the grace of God, having come to Christ, you now find yourself living a newness of life, both now and throughout all eternity. And this radical change is based on this fact. Your union with Jesus Christ. Your union in his life. Death. Burial. Resurrection. That union is what sets you apart. The Bible tells us that when we believe in Jesus Christ, God baptizes us into him. And we learned that baptism gives a new identity. And this baptism is not the water baptism. This baptism is the baptism of the Spirit. It is what gives you that new identity. And places you in Christ. So you now have the identity of Christ. And whatever is true concerning Christ in his life, death, and resurrection is true to you. So that is something very critical. And this is what then brings us to the text that we just read. In light of this truth, how are we to respond? So Paul tells us in verse 8 that now if we died with Christ some version says since we have died with Christ he, he is trying to tell you something. 
we believe that we shall also live with him. But let's look at the first one. What is it that we must believe? What we must believe is that we, that is means all of us, that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that have placed our faith in him and his death on our behalf, must believe we must understand it, be persuaded about this. That whatever is true for him is true for us. That we died with him. That is the first truth that we must hold on to. Now you may be asking what kind of death? This death is first of all a spiritual death. It doesn't mean that you physically die. No, what it means is that you spiritually died. When you believed on him. So there is a spiritual death that takes place to everyone that believes in Jesus Christ. You die to your old way of life. Secondly, this death is in the past. And the verb here that is used is the past tense. So what does that mean? It means that the moment you believed in Christ, you died with him. So in that moment, it's like God took you back 2,000 years ago and placed you with Jesus when he was crucified and there you were crucified with him. So as he was dying for our sins, you were dying with him to sin. So you died to the dominion of sin that was over you. I'm reminded of this story of this person that went to Israel on a tour. And so they were taken to Calvary. And the tour guide asked, has anybody been here? And this man put up his hand. And the tour guide said, you told me this was your first tour of Israel. How then do you say that you have been here? And he said, yes. When Jesus was crucified, I was crucified with him. I was here spiritually. God crucifying me with Christ. I died with him. I was with him. was buried with him. That is the revelation we need to have. That we died with him. We were present at his death. We died when he died. We died to our old manner of life. So it is in the past. It is now behind you. And this death has another characteristic. It was a complete death. It was not a swooning. It was not, it did not need a resuscitation. You died. 
waziri kabaliokewa wa kuzuki ze wafira dana and you were buried no ziki bwa that old wow. man who was buried oyo oh, muntu we da yaziki bwana ye and this was a shared death ero kufa kuno kwali kwali kugabanyitwa meaning you were crucified with christ ntinawe wakomerera so, munne you share this death with him mwaga bana wa mu mukufoku it was a real death kwa hali kufa kwa namba dala physical death on the part of Christ Kristo kuchitundu che yafa okuva mubiri on the spiritual aspect it involved you kati munse yo moyo nawe walimu but the beauty of this na ya te chirunje nyo is that this death e chikachi ne chokufa brought liberation to you kwa kuletero kutebwa so whatever held you bond bulie chali cha kusigaza mukomera okugoberera ekibi to death okufa lost Mangra. its grip over your life olu nakoro ne chi ne chiva kubulamu bono kufuga so before Edda. you had no desire to be set free te walina kuyaya na kutambula obwango wedde sin had you in bondage kubange ekibiki kyali kikufuga but you were set free na ye watebo kubere wedde the rain of sin ceased obufuzo obwe kibibwa kuba over your life obwafuganga gwe the day you died So what is the implication? The implication is what Paul brings to us. In the second part of verse 8. We were having said we died with Christ. He then says we shall also live So he wants you to believe that you died with him. And you shall also live with him. And this is something that you need to be convinced of. This is your statement of faith. But I want you to note something. He brings the we shall live with him uh, in the future. Ah uh, inachale tanti mubisere byo mase tulibe tulibera wa mun balamu wa muna ji. So you died with him. Wafa wa muna ji and you shall live with him. Na yo liba mulamu wa muna ji. So what is trying to say? Ategeza having died with him. Kubanga wa malo kufa wa muna ji. The life that you now have is a life that is perpetual so you have now been made alive with Christ why because he was raised from the dead why is that possible because when he was laid in the tomb you were laid in the tomb so when god resurrected him god resurrected us that place their faith in him when he comes into the newness of life we come to this newness of life but there is something more just as jesus cannot go back to the tomb nga yesu bwata liddamu okudda yeli mukufa muntanda and die afe nera just as he cannot go back to the reign of death nga bwata sobola kudda yo at once wo we fuga lyechi yo kufa neither can you mungeri yemu nawe tusobola i who have believed in him faba kiriza muje go back we, we can never return to our former way of life that life that we live is over it died with him was buried with him and the life that we now have is nothing like we've ever had or experienced before this is the new life in christ this is the zoe 
kind of life. Which we call the very life of God. Or the divine life. So the life that you now possess. Having died with him, been buried with him, raised with him. The newness of life that you now have is a life that Christ Jesus has. That is the divine life that leads you into a supernatural living. It is the life of God that is contained in the soul of man. Another characteristic of this life, it is new. It was never there before. It is unlike anything you had ever experienced. This is the brand new life which only God himself can give. So when we were dead in our trespasses and seen previously, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we now have this new life in us. The other aspect of this life, or characteristic of this new life, is abundance. Jesus quoted in John 10.10, 10, he says the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And he is talking about the sheep. It's talking about those that place their faith in him. So this life is given to us what we in want. supply. <laughs> in an excess surplus. It is given to us without measure. And it is sufficient to meet every need that you have. So Jesus gives us this abundance of life to meet every demand that life will bring to you. So it overflows. No wonder he says, ask that your joy may be complete. There is something that he links between the life that he gives which is now your possession and how then you align yourself to be able to receive it and not only receive it but evidence it. The fourth characteristic of this life is that this is a victorious life. This is a triumphant life. Greater is he that is in you than he that, than he that is out in the world. You have overcome him. There is something about him. It's not about your strength. Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. This excellence of power is the life 
that dwells in us. It is the life that overcomes the flesh. It is the life that overcomes sin. It is the life that overcomes the devil. This is a vibrant and robust life that is resident in every believer in Jesus Christ. And finally, this life is there to dwell permanently. It is not a life you receive today and it goes away tomorrow. God has come to make his home in you. By the power of the Holy Spirit. He now dwells in us. So this life is ours. To enjoy joy to experience throughout this life and also in the next. So we possess this life not only when things are going well, not only when there are seasons of prosperity. No, we possess this life irrespective of the circumstances we are in. It is a life that goes beyond the grave. It is a life that we will continue to have forever. It is a life that we will possess in heaven with God. It is a life we receive when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. So the point is this. Christ, when we place our faith in him and his finished work, does so much more for us. He forgives our sins. We are then, we then receive the righteousness of God. A measure of glory that we did not have before. And not only the righteousness, we receive the very life of God. So we have died to the reign of sin. Because of this life, now we are alive to God. In Jesus Christ. What else must we know? The second bit that we must know is what Paul brings about in verse 9. He wants us to know what Christ has done on our behalf. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion. Over him. Look at what he's saying. He's saying that because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he will never go back to the cross. He will never go back to the tomb. He will never go back to bear our sins. He will never again suffer for our sins to the point of death. Death no longer has dominion. It no longer has power. It no longer has mastery over him. When Christ submitted himself to the will of the Father, he bore our sins on the cross. At that point, at that very moment, sin momentarily 
had mastery over him. Ah, kasera ko akagire e chibi ne chifuga ne chimufuga. The scriptures tells us that he became sin. Din yafuka e chibi for us. So he suffered the penalty of sin in his body. It, it is at that moment that he became the propitiation of our sins. As brought forward in Romans 3.25 He paid the price for our sins and the price for our sin is death. It was death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Now, having paid that price, what this scripture is telling us that he will never go back to that previous So this is a reality that I want you to understand. Him not going back what does that imply to us who are now baptized in him into his death burial and resurrection since he cannot go back how about we who are now in him this tells us that we can never go back to our former life. Why? Because now we are in Christ. We are no longer in Adam. So we have been placed in Christ Jesus. So we now identify with him in his death, burial, resurrection, and his ascension. So now we are seated with him. So just as he cannot go back to his former state, we also cannot go back to our former life. So just as Jesus cannot go back to shedding his blood. I have had a lot of misconceptions where people say, you know, every time you sin, then you need Jesus on the cross. No, it can't happen. His death was a vicarious one. It was a death that was the grand finale. And the word that he uses is found in John 1930 where he says it is finished. It is finished. The price has been paid to its fullest. No other sacrifice is needed. So there is no other sacrifice for sin. When Jesus subjected himself to death, he shattered sin and its power over our lives. And that's what the writer in Hebrews tells us. He destroyed sin. He broke the authority of sin over our lives. Once and for all. So the dominion of sin and death has been over come once and for all. It was accomplished 
at the cross of Calvary. And so this is what we must understand. And in verse 10, he goes on to tell us, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Let's break up this statement. He begins by saying, for. What is he trying to do? He's trying to explain why is the dominion of sin and death that once heard us no longer has a hold of us. He says for death for, for the death that he died he died to sin. So Jesus yes. did not die for his own sin. He was sinless. He was without sin. He not only died for our sins, plural, but he died to sin. So what does that mean? It means that he died not only to pay for the penalty of our sins, but he died to break the power of sin in our lives. Two aspects. Died for our sins, which speaks to the penalty. He died to sin. That speaks to the breaking of the power of sin over our lives. And that's what Paul talked to us previously. In 521, the book of Romans, he said sin reigned in death. Even so, grace reigned through righteousness. So what is he trying to say? He said Christ died to break the reign of sin over our lives. That's why scripture tells us that Christ died to sin. What did he die to sin? What does it mean? It means he died to break the power of sin of our lives. When the scripture says he died for our sins, what that means is then he died for the penalty. But there is something here that I want us to note. The scripture says once and for all. So this is important. Once and for all does not mean for all people once and for all means it is an aspect of time. It means he died once. Never to die again. Let's repeat this. The scripture tells us that he died once for all. So, once for all does not mean once for all people. No. It means once never to die. Again. And this is what we see throughout scripture. Why is it more evident that in the book of Hebrews? Look at chapter 7. 
tugende mu sura yo musango first 26 to 27 um, the scripture says for it was fitting kubanga cyari cyetagisa for us to have such a high priest okufuna kabono omukuru nga ojo who is holy mutukuvu who is innocent tali ko musango and defiled tali mukuono and separated from sinners na eyayauli bo kuva kubono and exalted to the heavens na imusibwa muguru look at those characteristics who, who does, does not need daily atetaga ekikolo kya bulijjo like those high priests nga engeri yabakabona abakuru abali to offer up sacrifices okuwanga yo sadaka first for his own wasoko kuwa eyiye sins and then for the sins of the people kubibibya akoze aze ko nolwe bibibya abantu because this kubanga kyo he referring to the high priest because this he died once for all when he offered up himself so what is this Christ becomes the high priest who represents the people who represents his people Now this takes us back to the Old Testament. When the Lord instituted the sacrifices that were to be made on behalf of sin. So what the high priest did he had to make a sacrifice for himself. And then he made a sacrifice on behalf of the people. So these were made on a daily basis. They were made year after year. And why? Because they were symbolic. They did not have efficacy in themselves. They were not able to take away sin. All this was a dress rehearsal to cover. So when Christ died on the cross, he offered one sacrifice that was so perfect it could never be repeated again. It was a once for all time sacrifice. And this sacrifice was satisfactory. Hebrews 9:12 says not through the blood of goats and calves but through his own blood he has entered the holy place once for all having obtained for us eternal redemption look at Hebrews again 9:27 tugende mu sura yo mwenda rujira abiri musamu 28 he says for, for in as much as it is appointed for men to die once ngabwe chaba libwa abantu okufa omulundi gumu and then after it comes judgment i want you to listen to this he says it is appointed for men cha take bwawo eri buli bwana wo once and after death judgment and the bible says so christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of men will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Wait, what does this mean? He says he is divinely appointed. It is divinely appointed. All men, you live once, die, death, judgment. Even so Jesus Christ. He died. Yafa suffered 
the judgment of God on our behalf. This happened once. It cannot happen again. Why did it have to happen? Why does Jesus have to be the author of the salvation? The right of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, he says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take our sins. So none of those sacrifices was able to take our sins. None of them would purge the guilt of sin that tainted the human soul. Therefore, he comes to us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 to 7, and says, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have no desire but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. And he says, Behold, I have come in the score of the book it is written of me to do your will. Oh God. Jesus came Yes, we are to do the will of God. And that will required him to go to the cross. To offer himself as that perfect sacrifice for sin. All the bad offerings did not meet the measure. God was not pleased with him. What pleased him is what Christ did. And that's why in Hebrews 10, 10 he says, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So right now, He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And that is significant. He cannot come back to Calvary. He cannot come back to the grave. He has had victory over death. He has had victory over sin. So he can't come back because he's victorious. So what does that mean to us? So the effect is this. We are now in him. The one seated at the right hand of the Father. Since he cannot go back to the cross, then we cannot go back to our former self. Because our former self was crucified with him. Our former self was buried with him. So we can't go back to what was buried. We cannot go back to what died. So where we stand now, we stand with a newness of life. So if you give your life to Jesus Christ, 
Christ. This is what God promises. That you cannot go back to your former self. If you surrender your life to Jesus. See, and that's why it is important to surrender it. Because when you surrender it, it is crucified. It is buried. It will never come back to you again. Now you say, Pastor, but I periodically sin. Yes. But God has burned all the bridges. There is no way you can go back. <laughs> Paul adds in chapter 6 verse 10 Paulo anyweza and says but the life that he lives he lives to God the life that Christ lives he lives to God so if you are in Christ, the life that you now live, you live to God. Basically, you are living a life to the glory of God. So it is a life headed in a completely new direction. It is a life that cannot go backwards. And that is something Paul wants us to understand. He winds this up in terms of what the application is. And this is the first time we see Paul giving us an application. All the way from chapter 1 to where we are, he has not given us an application. He has been laying the foundation. Now he says, likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Christ Lord. Reckon yourself, rather consider yourselves to be dead to sin. And this is very important. This is the practice. He wants you to reckon yourself. He wants you to consider yourself. The Greek word there is the Greek word logizomai. Logizomai is where we get the word logarithm. Or the logical thinking. Or logistics. What he wants you to understand is take an inventory. Make an account. Be calculative. Be analytical. Critically think through this. And it is amazing that the first application is an application of critical thinking. Think about this truth concerning this life. So what he wants you to understand that the grip of death the grip of sin over your life has been broken. Think about this truth. The struggle that sin had over you has been broken. You have now been released to live a new life. You are once dead in sin. But now you are dead to sin. And this is something you need to consider. This is something you need to reckon. 
And not only that, but you are alive to God. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are dead to sin. But it doesn't end there. You are alive to God. In Christ Jesus our Lord. So you are spiritually dead to God and alive to sin. That was you in the past. Spiritually dead to God, but alive to sin. Now, based on your faith in Jesus Christ, everything has turned around. Now you are spiritually dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. Lord. So this new birth has totally reversed everything. So you are alive to God to love him to worship him, to glorify him. Your desire is to please him. Your desire is to pursue righteousness, is to pursue holiness, is to live in practical righteousness, Why? is to love others, is to live your life as God designed it to be. Why? Because you are now alive to God. You are no longer dead to Him. You are alive in Him. In Christ Jesus our Lord. You live this life in Christ Jesus. And this is absolutely important for you to understand that this life is in Christ Jesus. It is not in any other individual. It is not in a church. No church died for your sins. No pastor was raised from the dead. Only Christ has done this. And this is why life is in him. So everything we have talked about, this is where it begins. All the other applications begin here. You being dead to sin and alive to God. Based on your union with Jesus Christ. All the other applications of life. When he says don't let sin reign in your body. The basis is this. And here we need to understand several things. Now, one is that we have this assurance of salvation. And this is critical because God has brought about this change in us. This change alters your life significantly. The old volume of your book is closed. When you come to Jesus Christ, you are born again. A new volume of your life is open. So, this changed life is the fruit of what has happened to you. This is the confirmation that you are in Christ Jesus. A changed life is the proof that the old man has died with Christ. That the reign of sin has ended. And you have been raised in your life. I need to ask this question. Has this change taken place in your life? 
has this dramatic alteration in direction taken place? It is only the Holy Spirit that can do this. No spiritual leader gives you this certainty of salvation. Your, your parents cannot give you this experience. It is God and God alone. Paul says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. The same Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin, that draws us to Christ, that speaks this truth to our spirit, then regenerates us, draws us to repentance, gives us this saving faith, and then baptizes us in Christ Jesus. He continues to work and work in us, testifying to our very innermost being that we belong to Christ. And He changes us from inside out. The other characteristic that we need to know is the power over sin. And this is the basis of our union with Christ and of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is the Holy Spirit that helps us to resist the lusts of the flesh. Before the new birth, we could not do that. We lived to please sin. Now we can't do that. We cannot even blame anybody when we sin. No. Because we have the power in us. If we sin, it is us. We can't say the devil made me do it. You, can, you can't even say my old man. That old man died. We don't have an alibi anywhere. So the only thing we have to do is to fall at Christ's feet. And this, the scripture is fulfilled. That if we say we sin not, we deceive ourselves. And the truth be not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The other application I want you to know is our confidence in the face of death. Because there is one thing that is certain. Every living soul will die. And when we die, we have this affirmation that Paul has. In Philippians 1.21, where he says, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. So death to a believer in Jesus Christ means you are transitioning from one state to another. But the life you still have. Why? Because the sting of death was removed by Jesus Christ. So where you stand now, you have to evaluate is sin still the master over you? Or is it Christ? There is no middle ground. You are either in Adam or in Jesus Christ. And today, you are either saved 
Oinokubango walokoka. Or you are lost. Oba wabula. But I want you to give you an opportunity. To give your life to Jesus Christ. To surrender to Him. Die with Him. Be buried with Him. And rise to Him to newness of life. It can happen now. At this very moment. Would you say this prayer with me? Say, God of heaven, the merciful Father of all spirit. Here I stand before you. A sinner. A sinner by nature. Who needs a savior in my life. Jesus. Yes. You are the savior of the world. And today I surrender my life. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe, Lord, that you were raised from me. And today, I receive you in my life as the Savior and the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you say that prayer from the bottom of your heart, you have been wonderfully saved. You have moved from death to life. You have moved from loss to save. And now the power of God, the new life of God, is oozing from your very soul. There is that name on the screen. Please call. Somebody will give you the first basic instruction on this wonderful journey in the new direction and from Dominion Church. It's been a blessing to have. We believe your life has been tremendously blessed. So till we meet again, we say God richly bless you. Shalom. Thank you.